You're watching Hammer TV, alternative television. I want to start by telling you how I have come to this, this subject of reparations. It's been a, a life's journey. They put blinders on draft horses to make the horses less distractible, to make the horses more controllable. And in a figurative sense, when I grew up in the American South, in Richmond, Virginia, under total segregation, blind blinders were put upon us in our community. And that is, there were limits on what we were allowed to know about ourselves. And to the extent that we couldn't see very much to the left or to the right, or to the back, or to the front. African Americans were more controllable. I recall a saying that we had when we were growing up that was so popular in the United States. The old folk used to say from all the time, my parents included, from here to Timbuktu. And I had been taught to think so little critically that I had never asked about what the expression meant. I didn't know where Timbuktu was. I didn't even know that Timbuktu was a place. When I got to Harvard Law School, I was 26 years old. It was the first time I had ever sat in a classroom next to a white American. And I remembered being impressed about how wealthy the school was. Harvard is the oldest university in America, established in 1636. And it has become extraordinarily rich. It has an endowment now in excess of $20 billion. And I recall sitting in class, poor child from the South, seeing these oil paintings above the wainscoted, rich hardwood rooms of old, bewigged white men from the 17th and 18th century. And one was awed by it. This is Harvard. Thirty years would go by before I was to learn that Harvard Law School was established and made possible by a man named Isaac Royale, who endowed the law school from the proceeds he had gotten from the sale of slaves on his Antiguan sugar plantation. Our 
forebears with their appropriated labor endowed Harvard Law School. Brown University is a very prestigious Ivy League school in the United States. The Brown brothers made their fortune building and sailing slave ships. They established a bank in Providence, Rhode Island that was to become Fleet Bank, one of the largest in the United States. So much of America's institutional wealth has its roots in slavery. Aetna Life Insurance Company, the same story. The early buildings of Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. were constructed with slave labor by slaves from Louisiana who were labor sold to a plantation in another place. They were never paid. The United States Capitol. I remembered when I used to work there. And I walked through the rotunda time and time again. And I never looked up. And I remembered one day when I was writing, defending the spirit, I went down to the Washington Mall, walked up and down the mall with my daughter, Kalia, when she was just a little girl. And we were in the rotunda, and around the Around the wall of the rotunda is a hat band, a kind of frieze that depicts American history. And you will see everybody depicted in the frieze, except the people who built the capital of the United States. They were never paid. The stones were cut in Stafford, Virginia, and brought up the Potomac River by enslaved people. Atop the United States Capitol is a statue called, ironically, Freedom. It is a statue of an Indian maiden. It was made and cast in Bladensburg, Maryland by slaves, broken into parts, brought to the capital, reassembled, and hoisted to the top of the dome by our forebears. Until 1807, Britain, British businessmen, British merchants, British bankers, made unseemly sums of money from the slave trade. The royal family was largely financed by the slave trade. So much capital was accumulated by Britain from slavery that the Industrial Revolution, because of this in large part, was made possible. I have long term learned, long time learned now, that what you don't know will kill you. They're the blinders on the draft horse. You're not supposed to see that way or that way. You're not supposed to look behind. You're not supposed to know. When we talk about reparations, or at least when I talk about reparations, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about money, yes, but I'm not only talking about money. The money will run into the trillions when the calculation is done. 
But the crime is much larger than that. There is no worse crime than you can commit against a people than to strip them of the story of themselves. For if you don't know your past, you cannot see your future. From here to Timbuktu. I remember when I got to college, When I arrived at college, I don't think I'd had a teacher who said anything to us about Africa, anything to us about the slave trade, anything to us about our dilemma in history, anything to us about what we had been and what we were and how we came from there to this point. And I remember the professor, we were reading a book on Western civilization, and she asked the class, tell me, do you think the author is Catholic or Protestant? And it was the first time any teacher ever said to us anything about the author. The words were on the page, and the page was gospel. She said, all of this is subjective. You have to learn to think critically. You ought to know from reading the text what the disposition of the author is. Look behind the words. And so, from that point on, I began to develop an investigative curiosity about where we were and how we got here. It may be difficult for those who have not studied these things, given the blinders we've all been fitted with, to believe that in the 1200s and the 1300s, if one looked at Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Asia at that time. No one would have guessed a few hundred years from there that Europe would be near the top or that Africa would be near the bottom. Timbuktu was the cultural an academic center of the known world. They were doing cataract surgery in Timbuktu in the 1300s. And I didn't know anything about it. To deny me that information is a crime against humanity. One of the things that America does well, and all successful societies do well, is that it incessantly celebrates itself. In world opinion, it is at the virtual bottom now because of Iraq and other things in the regard of people who live around the globe, but to Americans inside America. There are no people on earth who practice more zealous self-love than do Americans. Virtually whatever we do is right and lovable because we're the greatest country on earth and we get everybody else to believe it too. And so when you look at the mall, you will see not a brick, not a stone, not a monument that will betoken and remember slavery. Hazel and I were reading last week an editorial in the 
in the New York Times. Just vilifying Japan for not owning up to their use of Koreans during World War II for Japanese troops as sex slaves. And they said that Japan must apologize. America has never apologized for slavery. And you see, the, the consequences that the contemporary victims of it know they're in a dilemma, but they have no idea of how they got there. There was another piece in the New York Times last week. The United States has put in place very severe immigration restrictions that have caused um, immigrants from, um, from Mexico, migrants, farm migrants, to, uh, to leave Colorado. And so the fields are full of corn and other vegetables waiting to be harvested. And the Colorado State Correction System has put in place a program where prisoners in Colorado are to harvest these crops for 60 cents a day. It is a modern slavery. But if you can't project it from anything that happened before, you can't understand always what you are looking at now. Somewhere after the civil rights movement in America, those people of privilege who were in a position to benefit, people like myself, who had once been in the same boat with the trunk of the black community, left the boat, went out and up and did well. And so now we can all look at Oprah as something we can and should become. We can look at Bob Johnson, who has, in my view, served us badly with the establishment of BET and BET's little children now across the Caribbean named Tempo and other strange things that are destroying our young minds. But those people left the black community because they never, they no longer had in common with those they had been in the boat with anything much anymore. And so the bigger part of the black community in America main, remained bottom stuck. And to some extent, I think people like me forgot about people like them. There are two million people in American prisons. Half of them are African Americans. America has one-twentieth of the world's population, but one-fifth of the world's prisoners. One in every eight prisoners in the world is an African American. This is modern slavery. Some might say, well, if they did the crime, they should do the time. African Americans commit 12% of the nonviolent drug offenses in the United States, but they constitute 75% of prison admissions for nonviolent drug offenses. A young African American who is convicted of a crime will serve exactly twice the sentence that a young white American will convicted of the same crime. 
They are the people who are going to be harvesting the crops in Colorado for 60 cents a day. And so much of the problem with this is are the dividers between us that cause us not to be e each other's brother and each other's sister so that we can't watch each other. You can't be concerned about things that you don't know about. And so freedom starts in here. We could get trillions of dollars from reparations, but if we can't fix ourselves in here, the money will do us no good. And so when people ask me about, well, I, I must say, I've, I've learned to deal with this now. When I used to work on South Africa issues, people used to say, well, we got problems over here. Why should we be concerned about problems over there? Uh, Mr. Robinson, you're not a South African, and I would say, but I am a South African. When I went to jail at the Nigerian embassy, I said, but you're not a Nigerian. I am a Nigerian. I am a member of the African world community and there are no borders that divide me from the rest of it. <laughs> Mr. Robinson, why would you move to St. Kitts? I am a petition. I'm at home and it doesn't make any difference the front on which I am fighting at any given time because it is one fight, not several. I saw in the paper today, and I don't understand the details and I didn't read it, and there are similar things happening across the Caribbean. That two Haitians had been deported. I think one of the greatest crimes against our people has to do with how little we've been allowed to know about how much we owe the Haitian people. Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessaline and a group of former slaves did what no other enslaved people anywhere in the world had ever done before and has been able to do since. And because of what they did, they have been caused to pay a price like no people on earth have been caused to pay. And because we have been fitted with the blinders, we have not been able to see what they did for us all. Napoleon Bonaparte wanted to expand his Louisiana territory westward to the West Coast. He had ambitions of world empire. And he wasn't able to do that largely because Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines and these slaves defeated France twice. 60,000 person armies commanded by Napoleon's brother-in-law. Military genius Louverture was. And then defeated the armies of France, of Spain and England. 
and made them turn tail to run back to Europe and put in place the first free black republic in the world. And then opened their doors to slaves, runaway slaves from anywhere in the world. You come to Haiti, you are a citizen. And then gave Simone Bolivar who was trying to liberate Latin America, all the guns and all of the ammo and all of the explosives and all of the everything he needed. And that's why a Haitian president's bus sits in the legislature in Caracas, Venezuela, because Venezuela is a free country today because of what Haiti did for it. I don't know if you know who John Brown is, but John Brown is an American who made war against the United States government before the Civil War trying to free the slaves. And for his trouble, he and his men, two of whom were black, were executed, hanged. We got a lot of Booker T. Washington high schools in America. There are no John Brown high schools. But John Brown was a great man, a white preacher who died for his beliefs that slavery was a moral wrong. In Haiti today, a main thoroughfare is named John Brown. Avenue. And when he died, the flags in Haiti flew half mast. These terribly creative people who remember Africa more than any other Africans in the diaspora, they remember it in their sayings. As they say, the axe forgets, but not the tree. They remember it in their language. They remember it in their religion that the world has taught even us to ridicule. It's amazing power of information, how they can turn people against themselves. We used to run away from slavery in the United States to, to Indian tribes that gave us refuge. There were five tribes, Seminoles and Choctaws and, and Chickasaws and Cherokees, five tribes they called in America where the people learned to call themselves the civilized tribes. And they were called civilized tribes because they too enslaved African Americans because they were trying to mimic what their southern white neighbors had done. You see, so out of this reparations business, out of this question, out of this exploration, out of this inquiry, out of this critical thinking, we will be victorious if we do nothing more than discover ourselves. You see, in America, we, we have tons of films on the Holocaust. We have tons of films on this, tons of films on that, reams of magazine stories about Rome and Greece and, and the ancient times and all of that, on and on and on, much of it fictional. Christ depicted as a blonde white man with blue eyes, which was not possible in that part of the world at the time. But we have been taught to believe it. And we don't realize that in the acceptance of much of the information, we also learn to hate ourselves. We have a story, we have a history, 
that is as glorious as any people's on earth. Danny Glover tried so hard to put the money together to, together to make the film of Toussaint Louverture. Who's going to put up the money? The film never got made. He who pays the piper calls the tune. We've got to find a way to do the things we believe in. We've got to learn what it requires to be an independent thinking people. We have to develop inside our ranks our own point of view. You see, any time you take a people and you make them into a shadow of what they were, it took our religion it took our languages, it took our mothers, it took our fathers, they took our names, they took our memories, they took our cultures, they took our mores, they took our insides. And they made us into people centrally proud of our cell phones. People who are in love with things. One of the great viruses, I think, infecting the West is that we've all become to be lovers of things. Nothing wrong with things. You know, I have no particular commitment to thinglessness. But there has to be something more. You see, it has a lot to do with how people are made resilient. One of the problems that the U.S. is having in the Middle East and in Iraq is that they didn't know it in their arrogance when it started. But they are dealing with people who remember who they were. The people who taught the world to read and write. A culture 7,000 years old, and its children remember it well. We need to put great investment in this. You see? And so much of it has to do with education. Because it seems to me that when you, out of this, give young people a purpose. I remember when I was going to college, I, I went on a basketball scholarship. I, uh, when I was in high school, I was very, very, very cool. I was, I was a big basketball star. And somewhere around the time of my maturation, I learned that it didn't make much sense to run up and down a court one way and then the other way. Although it was fun, it had little to do with anything of any consequence. That I needed to find some answers to some questions. And so I have found too often in our schools across the world as they used to say to us in our schools in America, our own teachers, I got mine, you got yours to get. It's the way I see these prisoners locked up in these jails. How can I be disengaged from them? They are the future of the black race in America and they have to be salvaged. There but for the grace of God go I. We are the same people. And so we have to encourage, we need a zeal, we need a, a, a new catching kind of phenomenon where our teachers come to believe that there is no greater purpose than you can serve than to be a teacher of children. 
and not just the ABCs, not just the one, two, threes, but asking them to think and to explore and to investigate and to know. Asking them to find out something about Monomatapa in ancient Zimbabwe. Asking them to know about the great kingdom of Mali. Asking them to find out something about uh, uh, the Benin in Nigeria. Asking them to, to find out something about Africa in the glory of its antiquity when it was second to no place in the world. Verifiable history. You see, a lot of things that people say about the history is, if not made up, embellished. Discovery Channel went to the Sinai Desert and could find nothing to verify that Moses had wandered in the desert. That's not to say he didn't, but there's no archaeological evidence to demonstrate that he did. It is not important to demonstrate it as long as the people who need to believe it, believe it. And they believe it because it's important to us. When you, when you walk on the mall, I don't know how many of you have seen that big statue of Abraham Lincoln sitting in the chair. People come from all over the world to see that thing. And you see Americans there. I once saw a couple from Nebraska. I could tell because they had funny shorts on and a dangling camera. I said, they must be from Nebraska or Idaho. And they were leaning against each other. And they were transfixed. They were mesmerized. They were practicing ancestor worship. And they were doing it because they needed to do it. You can't be a whole person unless you know your history and you revere your ancestors. And so when one thinks about why all the monuments in Washington, why all the tablets, why all the magazines, why all the statues, why all of this, it is so people will never forget that their society is old and productive. And so when we have children in our schools, that are not doing well. We have to learn to look at those children as the future of our world. And the good teacher, the good teacher sees potential in that child and loves that child. And the healthy society tells the teacher that we value you, teacher because you are more important than anybody in our society for helping us to make a future. If we don't salvage these children, we'll be running from them later. They're our children. We cannot disengage. They're our future. And to some extent, when you tell them who they are, you'll see set afoot a new child with a new pride and a new sense of possibility. So when one talks to me about reparations, don't, I've heard a lot of questions that sound like questions I might have asked when I wore the blinders. That was then, this is now. Who's going to get a check? Does Oprah need a check? On and on and on. It's not about the money. It is, but it is not. America has paid reparations to virtually everybody, but the group to which it cannot even rise to make an apology to. 
And so we have to be informed and implacable. We have to do it not just from those of us who are organizers, those of us who are agitators like myself. We have to do it from those of us who wear suits and ties to work every day, from engineers and from lawyers and from the Hollywood money people, from our actors, from our performers. We have to do it with a common voice. It only makes sense if you enslave a people and you steal from them the value of their hire and you take the appropriated value of that hire and you bank it and then you watch it grow over a century and a half. And then you see these great money families who buried the trail behind them of their success. And then you see these people in prisons who are the descendants of those who produce the wealth for these. Isn't it reasonable if somebody took something from you? to ask for recompense. I don't think it's unreasonable. It's been done for virtually every put-upon group in the world. Why was Aristide abducted by the United States and taken to the Central African Republic? France never forgot what Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines did to France. Aristide never forgot it either. He and Haiti attempted to challenge the very wealthy so that they would make better terms available to the very poor. France is the only case where after a people won and defeated his nation, he imposed reparations saying that the people had to pay France for having freed themselves. Haiti paid France in today's dollars, $21 billion. Didn't finish paying for it until 1947. It is in large part why Haiti is poor today. And so it was Aristide who said to France, it is time to talk about paying Haiti back the money that was extorted from it by you. It was then that France hardened its commitment with the United States to overthrow the democratic government of Haiti. What you don't know will kill you. Information is power. And so we're not talking about a few people. We're not talking about elitist information. We're talking about common information so that all of our children will have it. Let's teach them the things that are relevant to our time and to our mission. I can't think of anything more important than what you're doing now on this question of reparations because it will produce benefits that you can't even envision now. We will see children who will have lights in their eyes that we haven't seen for a long time. They will study harder. They will work harder. They will reach further. They will be empowered. And they will serve us time immemorial. And we must remember in the making of this struggle that all of our struggles everywhere won. 
that from Harlem to Johannesburg, from Nairobi, Kenya to Bastia, St. Kitts, from Antigua to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, we must remember always, always, for the sons and daughters of Africa, that the blood that unites us is thicker than the water that divides us. Thank you very much.